Welcome everybody. This is a webinar on the micro farm and whole farm protection revenue revenue protection programs. We are so glad we're at um, Farmer Campus. I'm Katie Brim and we're, we're honored to be co-hosting with Kitchen Table Advisors today and we're joined by the USDA Risk Management Agency who will be giving this webinar. Um, I'll introduce the speakers in a second. I just wanted to um, let you know that this is part of a workshop series that we're doing around financial preparedness for disaster in particular for small farms and ranchers. Um, so stay tuned, I'll share a little more information. We've had one on um, crop insurance, we've done one on financial preparedness for disaster and we'll be hosting one on financial recovery in February. So I'll share a little information about that at the end. We have two awesome guest speakers here today from the Risk Management Agency. Uh, we have Scott Shulin, um, who will be helping answer questions. Scott has been a risk management specialist at the Davis Regional Office um, and been with RMA for eight years. Um, he's a subject matter expert for all of the Hawaii programs and will be kind of filling in as Catherine Anderson gives the presentation. Catherine um, has partnered with us over the last year and has already read some awesome content. Um, and this is a pretty difficult subject. There's, it's convoluted and confusing. And we at Farmer Campus um, and Kitchen Table Advisors really wanted to help demystify these programs for you. And so we're um, happy to bring these specialists in to talk with you today. Uh, Catherine is a risk ma management specialist. She's been there for 17 years doing this work at the Re Davis Regional Office. And Catherine, I'll have you introduce yourself in a second. Just so you all know, there's about... Um, 30, 30, 40 minutes of content that she'll deliver. And then we will have questions at the end. I really encourage you throughout to go ahead and put your questions in the chat box. So um, for those of you unfamiliar with Zoom, you can go at the bottom and click on chat and just put your questions. You can share resources, whatever you'd like. Um, I'll be collecting those. And then at the end, we will open it to Q&A and we'll have um, plenty of time to get to your questions then. Um, because it's such a confusing topic, uh, your question might be answered um, by later on in the presentation. So um, just um, hold your horses and we will have lots of time to answer those at the end. Again, I'm Katie Brim from Farmer Campus. If you don't know us, we're an online learning platform for farmers and ranchers. We deliver all sorts of educational content specifically around barriers that farmers are facing um, unprecedented in these times. We look at climate change and wildfire resilience, financial preparedness around economics, um, agroecology, food sovereignty, all sorts of things. So I'm so happy that you're here today. Um, I'll share my contact in the chat so you can be in touch. And without further ado, I'd love to welcome Catherine in. Um, Catherine, if you could just introduce yourself and then you can go ahead and share your screen and start the presentation. <laughs> Yeah, I'm Catherine, and like she said, I've been with RMA uh, 17 years, and uh, each of our specialists are uh, subject matter, matter experts in different crops. Mine happen to be uh, mint and wheat and the small grains, uh, forage production, whole farm, as well as nursery, um, and there's a few more that I can't think of off the top of my head, but um, I'm glad to be here. I'm going to be, um, I, I won't be sharing my video. I, I, I have to, to preserve bandwidth. I'm going to um, shut my video off so that we don't have any hiccups during the presentation. Okay, so. And let's see, share screen. This is it. Is it sharing? Looks great, Catherine, go ahead. Okay, because I don't see it on my end at all. Okay, oh, there it is. Okay, I guess. Yep, we can see it. You're in presentation mode, so you can go ahead. Um, okay. So <clears throat> let me so let me explain that whole farm revenue protection, which I'll we sort of abbreviate and call it whole farm is a product that's entering into its ninth year that covers farm revenue produced on the whole farm for the insurance year. So what it does is that it covers all the crops that 
the whole farm, all the crops that are on your farm on a revenue basis. The USDA agency that offers federal crop insurance is a risk management agency and a portion of the producer premium amount is subsidized. And so whole farm is sold by approved insurance providers that have a reinsurance agreement with the Federal Crop Insurance Corporation. These companies have insurance agents that sell whole farm directly to producers and loss adjusters who work with producers when there's a loss. And this plan of insurance is the first uh, FCIC plan of uh, plan that's been offered nationwide, and it's in every county and every state. So, well, as we said, I'm from the Davis Regional Office, and we are tasked with administrating the federal crop insurance programs in Arizona, California, Hawaii, Nevada, and Utah. We also provide outreach to help farmers with risk management tools. So crop insurance has a unique delivery system through public-private partnership. RMA is responsible for developing and maintaining federal crop insurance policies. This includes determining the rates, prices, and yields for each crop at the county level every year. RMA is also in charge of compliance to prevent fraud or abuse. And then on the other side is independent crop insurance agents sell the policies to farmers under approved insurance companies that underwrite the policies and settle the claims if there's a loss. The federal government subsidizes the premiums to reduce the cost of crop insurance to the farmers and reinsures the private insurance companies to share the cost of the claims. If, multi, if multi-parallel crop insurance was sold only in the private sector, it would likely not be affordable to the average farmer. So in summary, RMA manages the Federal Crop Insurance Corporation to provide crop insurance products to American farmers and ranchers. Approved insurance providers, which we abbreviate and call AIPs, sell and service federal crop insurance policy through a public-private partnership with RMA. And the other part of our job as uh, in RMA is that we wanna make sure that our programs um, that we have reflect what the growers are growing and what they're doing. So it's important, you know, we're in the field quite a bit. It's important that we are, we're on the ground with the farmers that if changes need to be made to a policy that we implement them. I know the Scots been to Hawaii and has had to make quite a few changes to the Hawaii prop, uh, policies so that they actually become workable for the growers. Um, I had to make a lot of changes to the mint policy up north to make sure that it worked for them. So that's an important role that we have. And we want to hear from, you know, hear from the growers if, if there are issues that need to be resolved and so we can make the program workable for them. So why should you get federal crop insurance? Well, it may help you stay in business after a severe weather event like we're having right now, or low production year, or low prices. It provides some financial stability and may improve the access to credit. Um, for many um, banks, they will require you to have crop insurance if you wanna get a loan from them. So it, it can play an important role because they want to see that you're mitigating risk. So it could crop insurance could make a difference between staying in business or going out of business after a disaster. So, so what the so we have two programs that we're talking about today. We're going to be going back and forth between them. Uh, Whole Farm was first offered in 2015 to provide coverage for all crops under one crop insurance policy for diversified producers, including specialty and organic. Microfarm uh, was offered in 2022 as a streamlined approach to Whole Farm, specifically for small producers. So in comparing the two, you're going to see that in Whole Farm will cover, cover covers up to 17 million of revenue whereas microfarm insures farm operations with an approved revenue up to 350,000 
for the initial year and 400,000 for carryover. Um, on whole farm, post-production costs are not included. Expected value are primarily based on third-party sources. Expected yields are based on underlying policies or in the, ins the insured's four-year average. And under whole farm, they may purchase additional individual crop policies. They must be at buy-up coverage levels. Any indemnities from these policies will count as revenue earned under whole farm. And to explain that where, where it says that you can have individual crop policies, it's possible um, in 2015, some of you may remember when the pistachio industry took a complete nosedive because of a catastrophic event where we had summer showed up in December and they all the um, trees lost their bloom. So I had, I had some growers who had whole farm policies as well as uh, the pistachio MPCI policy. And between having both policies, they were basically able to be, to continue on in business. So one offset the other, you, know, you can't get double coverage, but um, one, the one that the policy that paid the most ended up being whole farm because it was a revenue-based program and they were able to stay in business. Microfarm, on the other hand, requires less, has much less paperwork requirements. Um, Post-production and value added costs may be included in the approved revenue. Um, expected value and yields are based on the insurer's past three-year average of total revenue in acres. And under microfarm, you are not allowed to have any individual crop policies. So that's where it's a big difference between the two. You can have microfarm, but you can't have, um, you can't buy any MPCI policies. And so microfarm is a more accessible version of whole farm. So they're, they're basically the same program, but one's much simpler and as rules are a little bit different. Um, as I said, it ensures revenue between 350,000 K for up to the initial, in the initial year and 400 for uh, carryovers. Um, and post-production value at a cost may be included in improved revenue. For example, jams, jellies, or pies made from fruit produced on a farm operation. Um, the expected value and yields are based on the insurer's past three average of total revenue in acres. Um, so like I said before, one of the main differences between the two is that whole farm requires expected value and yields for each commodity, whereas microfarm will use the average of all of the um, revenue and acres. Um, revenue um, comes from all commodities produced on the farm, and that includes hemp, animal and animal products, commodities purchased for resale up to 50% of total, excludes uh, timber, forest, forest products, and animals for sports, show, or pets. Replant costs are available for whole farm with approval, but not available under microfarm. So what causes a loss payment under whole farm or micro farm? And that would be natural causes of loss and decline in market price during the insurance period. And that may include adverse weather conditions, which is fire, it can also be fire, earthquake, insects or plant disease, uh, failure of irrigation water supply if caused by an insured peril that occurs during the insurance period wildlife unless control measures have not been taken and in accordance with subsections D and E, a decline in the market price. Also taxes must be filed for the policy year before any claim can be made. When revenue to account for the policy year is lower than insured revenue, the loss payment will be made. Um, so one thing to keep in mind with whole farm, um, and micro as opposed to a uh, MPCI policy. The MPCI policy will generally pay out after 
you've had you made your claim and it's all been processed and, and if there is money coming you'll get paid at that point with whole farm and micro you won't get paid until um, you've paid your taxes till you've filed your tax returns so let's say in this year you you have a loss for 2023 but based on when you file your taxes let's say if you're in a normal tax year you're not a um, late filer but you're a regular filer you would get paid after you file your taxes next year so that's that's probably the downside but there are some just so you know there are some um let's see there are some programs out there that i'm aware of that um California Farm, let's see, there's one, I've, I'm now, I'm, I'm just, is escaping me the company, but there is one where they, they offer bridge loans so that if you already have insurance and that, and you need help until you get paid, they'll step in. And I'll, I'll get the name of that before the end of this uh, session is over. Cause I suddenly just went out of my head. I had it there and it went. So whole farm and micro is insured revenue is determined by the lower of the current year's expected revenue determined on the farm plan at the selected coverage level or the adjusted historic revenue at the selected coverage level. So in talking about post-production and value added, for microfarm, post-production value added and market readiness operations may be included in the expected prices and allowable revenue. Whole farm, post-production and value added costs must be removed from expected prices and allowable revenue. Costs from market readiness operations may be left in the approved revenue. So market readiness operations is defined as minimum required to remove the commodity from the field and make market ready. And that could be on farm, in field, or close proximity to the field. So within whole farm and micro, we have coverage options. And so we have flexible um, coverage levels to tailor to your need. So we have between 50 to 85% coverage and 5% increments and diversification of three commodities, which we call our commodity count is required for 80 and 85% whole farm. Um, and micro farm automatically qualifies for 80 and 85% coverage. And there's no catastrophic level available. So for whole farm limits on qualifications, um, it covers up to 7 million in revenue. Uh, coverage is limited to 2 million in expected revenue from animals and animal products not applicable to aquaculture. Coverage is limited to 2 million in expected revenue for greenhouse and nursery not applicable to aquaculture. And products also insurable under nursery policy and does not include items such as produce grown in hoop houses. So when I say under, under the nursery, if growing the actual crop, not just the plant, then the crop would be listed as the crop. For example, tomatoes, not, they're not under greenhouse or nursery. So there's a little bit of separation what constitutes a greenhouse nursery as opposed to just a crop. And as I mentioned, the 2 million limit is not applicable to aquaculture commodities. So you can see there, um, in order to get the uh, coverage level of 80 to 85, or to opt, opt for the coverage level of 80 to 85%, you're gonna have to have a commodity count of, of at least three for whole farm. So, when you need to expand or help when bad years occur, occur, um, historic revenue is adjusted by farm expansion. The automatic historical revenue adjustment calculation that accounts for farm growth. And insured doesn't have to 
and he may opt out for this adjustment. And then expanding operations provision allows for up to 35% growth over historic average for most operations and with insurance company approval. For expanding operations due solely to certified organic production, the limit on growth is the higher of 35% or 500,000. You also have the options to account for bad years. You can do revenue substitution, revenue exclusion, and 90% of the approved yield. So for revenue substitution, each year below 60% is replaced with 60% of the producer's simple average or indexed average for calculating historical revenue. For revenue exclusion, producers average historical revenue calculated using remaining four years of history. And then for the 90% cup of the producer's whole farm historic average for current year will be at least 90% of the previous year's approved revenue. So there are some options, like I said, for um, helping when when there are some when bad years happen, like could be happening this year for many, many of the growers. So one of the key things with whole farm is diversification. And <coughs> And it requires three commodities. Uh, Microfarm automatically uh, gets it. And then additional whole farm diversification requirements. Um, and it, we're not quite, it, it was put in, Congress put it in that pot potato farmers must have two commodities. Um, and commodities insurable with other, other revenue coverage must have two commodities. So if you have it, under whole farm, if you have a, another policy and it's revenue based, you're going to have to show at least two commodities under whole farm. You won't be able to do it with just one. And what the diversification, diversification measure um, also determines is the amount of the discount of the premium rate. Uh, Microfarm has a set discount, but whole farm um, premium subsidy for farms with two or more commodities um, reduces the premium rate for the insured, which reflects the lower risk of revenue loss for a farm with multiple commodities. So here's one thing to understand, though, with whole farm is that, um, and with both, especially with whole farm, um, is that if you're if let's say you have five crops and three of the crops do really well, but two actually absolutely tank. And, but when you add it all up, um, you don't have, you end up not having a loss because you did really well with three other crops. So that can be kind of the downside with whole farm is that you might think, well, I'm going to get a payout this year because two of my crops did really bad. Well, not really because we're looking at the whole farm. So there has to be a loss that um, overall loss for the whole farm, not just individual crops. So that in one sense could possibly be a downside, you know, for a grower if, if uh, as opposed to if he was able to get a policy that um, for that, an MPCI policy for an individual crop, let's say almonds. So if he had an almond policy and he had a loss there, he might get a payout. But under whole farm, he might have almonds and have five other crops and isn't able to get a payout. So that's where the, the difference comes in between the two. So this just shows you the, um, the percentage of total premium paid by the government. So, um, the coverage based on the coverage level and how many counts you have. So clearly you can see that if you had three or more crops and you're getting at 80%, um, the government is paying 71% of your premium. You know, so that's substantial, you know, so there's, there's some definite benefit and that's how the government is stepping in to help make this program affordable for you.
So if you're a beginning farmer rancher or veteran farmer rancher, meaning uh, been in business 10 years or less, you can receive an additional 10% points of premium subsidy for additional coverage policies, which we call buy-up, that have premium subsidy. And transitional and organic grower assistant programs, um, premium assistance is available if, the, if growing and or transitioning to organic. So here's some other facts to understand about whole farm and micro farm. Um, whole farm and micro farm covers revenue produced in the insurance period. Produce is a key word here because a commodity may be produced during the insurance period, but not harvested or sold, but will still be included as revenue at claim time. Um, and so, a commodity not harvested or sold will count as revenue. A commodity grown last year and sold this year will not be covered. That's what I just sort of explained. For commodities that grow each year, like cattle, only the growth for the insurance year counts. So if a calf was worth 800 at the beginning of the year and was sold at 2000, the value insured would be 1200. And then inventory and accounts receivable are used to determine the produced amount. Um, expected prices for direct marketed commodities under whole farm and for commodities under micro farm are determined by the previous three-year average of allowable revenue and acreage for all commodities produced on the farm operation. Post-production and value-added revenue may be included in allowable revenue and expected prices under micro farm. So post-production Post-production operations, um, these consist of costs from activities that occur after the harvest of the crop to get the crop ready for the targeted market. So some of these act, uh, expenses um, associated with them could be sorting, grading, washing, waxing, labeling, trimming, packaging material, such as boxes, cartons, and bags. Uh, packaging of commodities after they are harvested, including infield operations, cold and controlled atmosphere storage. So if they have to go into a warehouse, that might be that would be considered. So other facts to understand about whole farm. Prices and yields used to value commodities to be grown must meet the expected value and yield guides in the policy. The values must be, must be what producers can reasonably expect to receive in the local area for the commodity. And if possible, based on third party sources. Marketing contracts used at the time they become effective within policy limits is also a way to determine the, the pricing or the value. The yields must be what the producer can reasonably expect to produce under normal growing conditions. So in other words, you know, you're not going to take a, a crop that isn't in our, that's not grown in our area and decide that you're going to insure it. Um, probably an example, it would be like if you took almonds, almonds only grow in California, and you stuck them in the middle of Minnesota not going to work. You can't, can't, that's not going to work. Um, for commodities also covered under, um, so the yields must be what the producers can reasonably expect to produce under normal growing conditions. And so that could be, um, we can get data from other FCIC plans of insurance, um, the approved yield for underlying policies, like let's say in almonds. For commodities, no, no, that no other coverage, the insured's four-year average yield using replacement yields when allowed by the policy. So we we want to make sure that you go to um, that that we have yields and values that are fairly accurate and reflective of that area. So what information is going to be required? 
So here's where the difference comes in between the two policies. For whole farm, we need five years of tax forms. For micro, it's going to be three years of tax forms. And as explained there, um, the exception would be if you're a, if you're a beginning farmer or rancher or tribal entities, um, you, you may qualify for only three consecutive years of Schedule F. And if you don't have a Schedule F, it's also possible to complete a substitute Schedule F if you filed farm tax forms other than Schedule F. So there's a way to um, make the tax forms work. So for microfarm, if, and that's obviously easier, for 2023, it's going to require tax forms for 2020 to 2022. Uh, for calendar and early fiscal filers, 2019 to 2021 for late fiscal filers. What information is going to be required? It's going to be information about what will be produced on the farm during the insurance period. Um, that's for whole farm. And then for micro, total revenue and acreage for the last three years. So the big difference between those two is that whole farm splits every crop out, you know, each one that you're growing, they, they split it out separately for, um, you know, what you're growing, the yield, the value. Whereas with micro, they're looking at, you know, an acreage for the last three years. And then you're going to uh, create an intended farm operation report. And you're going to have to uh, provide any kind of supporting records if requested, organic certification, inventory, or accounts receivable, receivable information. Um, expense reporting is no longer required for a whole farm. We made that change in 2023 to reduce the paperwork burden. So sales usually begin by September 1. The last day to purchase is sales closing date. For late fiscal filers, for all counties, that's November 20th. For Arizona and California, it's February 28th. Hawaii, Nevada, and Utah, it's March 15th. And the revised farm operation report is due July 15th for all insureds. Uh, the contract change date is August 31. So to explain that a little bit better is that if if you have a crop that you know, you know, let's say you take whole farm or micro, either one, but one of one of your crops you know might be at risk. Let's say in um, the month of February, you might want to get your insurance put into place at least by January, so because you still have a month out once you apply, then there's like a month lag. So you want to make sure that you give yourself ample time and you look at your crops to see, you know, what is your vulnerable time and make sure that you, you're covered during that time of vulnerability. And the contract change date, uh, well, the revised farm operation report is due July 15th for all insureds and the contract change date is August 31. And then the billing date is August 15th for all insureds. And then the final farm operation report is completed the earlier of the time of loss determination or next policy year's sales closing date. If not completed, it's limited to 65% coverage for the next year. So in a recap, um, whole farm covers up to 17 million of revenue, post-production costs are not included, Expected value are primarily based on third-party sources. Expected yields are based on underlying policies or insured's four-year average. May purchase additional individual crop policies, but they must be at the buy-up coverage level. And then any indemnities from these policies will count as revenue earned under whole farm. Whereas with microfarm, there are less paper, paperwork requirements Insurers farm operations with approved revenue up to 350K for the initial year and 400K for carryover policies. Post-production and value added costs may be included in approved revenue. Um, automatically eligible, eligible for 80 and 85% coverage. 
expected value and yields are based on the insurer's past three average, uh, past three year average of total revenues in acres. No individual crop policies allowed. So the way you're able to get this is you have to crop, contact a crop insurance agent. So what I wanna say about this though, is that um, no agent can offer you a better price. Um, prices are all regulated by the federal government. All that they can offer you is maybe better service. And this is where I say, you know, talk to other growers in your area to see if, if you're new to insurance, talk to other growers that you know and see who they recommend. I think recommendations are always the best way to go and um, see how they feel about the agent, how, how is the agent service them and, and make your decisions based on that. And it's okay to, to check with numerous agents, but you can go to this website and um, we're not allowed to give you any recommendations, you know, but you can go to the agent locator and you can download or put in where you where you're located and find agents based on that. And we're now at questions time. Awesome. Thank you so much, Catherine, for delivering that content. Um, I know it's dense for everybody. We've had quite a few questions come in um, from Amber and G Gabrielle, mostly. And I'll, if those of you, if you've not put some questions in the chat, you can, of course, ask them now. Um, but to, to kick us off, I'm going to ask the questions that have come in. Um, some of those might have been answered as we went. Um, I'm going to ask one that I've heard from two people. Catherine, there's um, some confusion around the micro farm being an option for beginning farmers because of the last three years of revenue reporting. Um, does that mean, so that one of the questions was as, as new farmers, um, we have three years of losses on our schedule up. Does this mean we can't get crop insurance? Are we confusing farm profit with farm revenue? Um, there are a couple of people asked, asked that privately. So could you address that? Um. Scott, can you help me out with that? Yeah, um, I, I believe you can still get coverage um, if, so I believe the, is the question that if you don't have the, the three years of records, because with, um, as Catherine mentioned, with micro farm, uh, we have three years of records and that's the difference with whole farm, whereas it requires five years. Um, you may also um, qualify as a beginning farmer or rancher, um, or if you've qualified for that in the previous year, um, there are situations where you may be able to uh, use another person's records. Uh, if you took over at least 90% of their operation, they can allow you to use those records. So that would satisfy the three-year record requirement. And if they have the records, but they don't have the profits, are they still eligible? To my knowledge, yes. I don't, I don't believe that would disqualify them. I'm not 100 percent sure on that. Yeah, I don't think it would. I don't think it would disqualify. I mean, I think we're thing, we're just looking for. Do you have Do you have those records? Because those records are the the baseline that we need to underwrite right. the policy. So, um, I you know your their their expected values and their yields and everything will be calculated based on those records. So, um, I believe they'd still qualify though. Great, um, Amber or Gabrielle, do you want to ask any follow up questions on that? I move on. Beginning farmer eligibility. Okay, great. Um, okay, so then we had a question about um, how this applies to livestock or pasture area impacts that are leased and not owned. Amber, that was from you. Would you like to clarify on that? Sure, thanks, Catherine. I think you answered part of that when you did the livestock um, calculations, um, but the question was, how is pasture viewed as a crop? Um, and especially when, for example, with contract grazers, they're you know often leasing the areas that they're on. And so if they're uh, experiencing impacts that affect the growth rates of their livestock, I'm just curious how this may or may not apply. I'm, let's see, I'm trying to, Scott, do you by chance? Um, so, 
you're wondering about if if your leasing ground, if that would be covered? Yeah, so we often get questions from um, contract grazers about wildfire impacts to areas that they lease and how, you know, if you had crop insurance, how would that work if you were leasing? So um, to, to my, and my understanding is as long as they have an insurable interest in that land, they would, they could be covered under the program. Uh, with livestock Great. as well. And we also have a pasture rangeland forage program for livestock as well. That could also be an option for, for those grower, uh, those ranchers. Thanks, Scott. Thank I'm gonna, um, Catherine. I'm gonna stop your sharing your screen so that okay. we can all see each other, and you can turn back on your video so people can see you. Um, if you would, that would be great. Thank you. Okay, and then um, there was a question: Are honeybees covered under the micro farm policy or program? Um. Yes, they yes. are. Yeah, they're in the commodity. Um, they're in the commodities list. If you were to go to our website, um, I'll, I'll put a, I'll provide a link at the end of this for everyone, so uh, it can direct them right to this uh, tool that we have, where you can look up. Uh, depending on which state and county you're in, you can go ahead and look at our whole farm uh, options for your county, and we have a long commodity list of things that are covered uh, on there, and uh, honeybees are covered as well as we also have a separate apiculture uh, program for, for bees as well, so. Awesome, great. And then um, for the micro farm um, loan, could you please explain the 350K initial year and 400K carryover coverage numbers? It just means that you can have up to um, uh, 350, your, you know, your um, farm can be up, up to 350,000. And then if you go carry over, you can go up to 400. Sam, and that's that... what, oh, go I'm ahead. sorry. And I was just gonna say then that's again, one of the main differences with micro farm and whole farm is micro farm having that, uh, that lesser amount of coverage as far as liability on your farm versus uh, whole farm, which is much higher. So it really de just depends on, on your operation. Great, Sam, does that make sense? Or do you have any follow-up questions on that? Um, it doesn't really make sense to me. Does that mean like if I was to put in a claim, they would pay out up to $350,000 and then I just don't understand what carryover is? Carryover is just the term that we use if, uh, if you've had a policy in force previously. So year after year, that's what we would consider a carryover insured. So in your initial year, you'd be limited to 350,000 cap on the total uh, insurable revenue you can have on your farm. Whereas if you're if you in year two, let's say, you would be eligible for up to 400,000. And does that mean that like my farm revenue is 350, 350 isn't the potential payment out to the farm? Because I noticed that they said 17 million was a payment for whole farm revenue, but that was actually like up to $34 million at like the 50% level of coverage. Let me see here. So. Trying to find that slide that you're referencing. Okay, so <clears throat> so from the 17 million, uh, if it says it covers up to 17 million, if you saw the 34, that's just saying that um, you could have as high as 34, but you're we're only going to cover 17, and it, it's going to depend on your coverage level as well. So that's uh, I don't know if if you had a slide on that, Catherine, where it I don't think I did covered that, but there is one where it's. Uh, it shows you the coverage levels and based on the maximum approved revenue that you can have. Um, Scott. So, the, so the thirty-four, the thirty-four million, if you had it at the fifty percent coverage level, that would be that seventeen million. That's where that comes from. Do you have a slide on that, Scott? Would you mind sharing your screen and just? Sure. Let me see here.
And David and Judith, I also have your questions highlighted. So we'll get to you in a second. Okay, so, so I hope you can see it now. Uh, I just have a, a screenshot here, just showing you different coverage levels and what your maximum approved revenue could be, you know, depending on your coverage level. So if you'll notice down at the bottom here, that's where that 34 uh, million comes from, is, is that if you had 50% coverage level, you could have maximum approved revenue that high, but you you're still you're going to be limited to 17 million. So you could at 50% coverage get that. And as you could see, as you go up in coverage levels, uh, the approved revenue is going to change based on that. Right. So for the micro loan, does that mean say if the level's 350k that by farm at 80% coverage actually could bring in a revenue of 437k that and then it would pay out 350k? Same. Correct. Kind of yes, you're going to be yes. Yes, you'll yeah. you'll be limited to that cap of 350 in the first year or 400 as in subsequent years. Okay. Any other questions on this subject? Okay, great. Um, thanks for that clarification, Scott, and thanks, Sam, for the questions. Uh, go ahead, David, you've got your hand raised. Yeah, can you speak to estimated oh. premiums on the micro farm program? Um, say per 50,000 in revenue or per 100,000 or whatever, and um, uh, is there a minimum annual premium? And then I know you you had a slide up, Catherine, that showed the percentage of subsidy per per level. Um, if if you can share that again, or if that's available online somewhere. As as far as the um, the uh, estimate on what it would cost, um, we have a cost estimator tool that's really tough to say depending on. Uh, your operation, your needs, but we have a cost estimator tool on our website. Um, and then the other thing that uh, if, if that doesn't work for you is if you were to contact an agent, an agent can walk through this with you and show you different options for you and coverage levels. But uh, I don't have any to share uh, examples for that. Yeah. Uh, Catherine, so, do you have, Catherine, no, do you have it? No, I don't. It, it, they would have to go to the, um, like I said, the cost estimator. I don't have any Where, slides that show that. Do you have a web address for that cost estimator? Yeah, yeah I'll drop it in the, I'll drop a link in the chat box here. Awesome. Okay. And then do you Thank know, you. is there a minimum annual premium? Well, I'm not aware of a minimum. I'm not aware. No, I'm not aware of that. No. Okay. Not aware of that at all. Thanks, David. Thanks, Scott, for sharing that um, resource when you have it. Sure. Um, Judith asked, is the ability to use another person records when you take over limited to the microform or does it apply to the whole farm too? Uh, it should apply to both. Okay. Yeah, that's a that's a that's um, an exception if you're a beginning farmer rancher or a veteran farmer rancher. Right. And then Tushar asked um, about how to estimate actual premiums for microfarms with three or more crops. I'm assuming that's through the tool you're about to share. Is that correct? Yes. Tushar, did you did you have further questions about that? Okay. And it's a really good idea. It's a really good idea for you to actually talk to an agent, you know, um, because they're going to be able to, you know, really look at your operation and come up, you know, with more accurate numbers and guesstimating. Um, so to start asking, yeah, um, is the whole farm the same as for the micro farm for estimating the premium? 
Well, it's the same. You you go to the same location. I mean, it's gonna it's gonna depend. Both of them depend on your commodity count and all of that. I mean, you have a higher commodity count that you can have in whole farm. You know, new. You know, up to you know. I I forgot how far you can go up to, but probably like at least eight crops or better. I think I know of a grower that has like fifteen crops. So your commodity count will make a big difference. You know if you know in your subsidy you know at least if you have if you want to get the 80 85 and whole farm and that's going to where in micro you do automatically get the 80 85 so there is a difference okay i think is, is that is that clear to try do you have any other questions um It might be helpful if you unmute yourself to share because um, I feel like I'm not getting to the root of your question. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so sorry, my, sorry about the confusion. My, my question was to estimate the premium uh, using this uh, website, there is a uh, option, detailed criteria where you have to select the insurance plan. So I'm trying to figure out for the micro farms the insurance plan name is the whole farm revenue protection or there's some other name for the insurance plan? I, and you're referring Fair. to, are you referring to the cost estimator tool? Yes. Uh, let me take a look here. And did you, uh, are you in the personalized estimate? Yes. Okay, so. But I don't see any micro farm. So is there one specific to the micro farm programs? I'm at? taking a look here. Let's see. Okay, so yeah, for 2023, there is if you if you scroll down in that insurance plan box, uh, if you scroll down towards the bottom, it's in alphabetical order. There's whole farm revenue protection listed, um, but I don't see, I don't see micro in here. So let me see if that would. My micro farm is on there, um, I, but when I hit update at the bottom, it doesn't, like it doesn't do anything. There's a little check box that says whole farm revenue protection with a code of 76. But when I enter micro farm and all my info, commodity year, state, uh, county, et cetera, update doesn't, like it doesn't display anything, but micro farm is on there. What, what is the name of that insurance plan? For the micro it's, farm? it's it's alphabetical. It's, um, it's micro farm with a code of 9110, if I'm looking at the right thing here, but. What we can do is we can check, you know, we can check to see if there's an issue and check within our May to see if there's an issue on um, being able to access that. Okay, great. So maybe Scott and Catherine, could you look into that and get back to me and I'll, I'll send out, um, I'll be yeah. sharing resources at the end of this. Um, I have all of your emails if you um, registered through Eventbrite and I'll send out clarifying um, answers as well as the recording of this. Um, after, afterwards. Um, okay, so G G Gabrielle asked, um, what do you mean by a separate program for pasture and rangeland and ap ap apiculture, like different insurance types in addition to the standard whole farm? Yeah, we have a MPC, is multiple peril MPC crop insurance. And so we have separate programs for apiculture. We have a separate one for PRF, which is pasture, rangeland, forage. Um, we have, I think, what is it? How many do we have, Scott? Probably what, 50, 60 different programs? Uh, so it, well over 60 now, yeah. Yeah. And so they're broken out by, in, you know, so like there's pistachios, there's almonds, there's mint, you know, there's tomatoes, there's processing tomatoes, there's, you know, a lot. And so PRF, is is one of the came about a few years back so it's one of the newer programs you cannot have micro farm and prf 
It's only within Whole Farm that you can have an MPCI policy, and it has to be at a buy-up level. So you can't take 50, you know, you, you could have Whole Farm, but if you went and got a, let's say, PRF policy, you'd have to be higher than 50%. So you'd be buying up to like 65, 70% or, or better. Gabrielle, does that answer your question? Or do you want to unmute and clarify? And, and this is where, again, it's, it's not a bad okay. idea to talk to an agent because they can look at your operation and they can tell you what other programs that, that we, you know, that you can be insured under that may be a better fit than whole farm or micro. I think that the biggest the biggest issue with micro for a beginning farmer is that they may not have those three years of tax records. You know, uh, same thing with whole farm. You know, if you don't have the adequate tax records and you can't get in the program. So there might be, based on the crops that you have, there might be other programs that might be better suited for you. Awesome. Thanks, Catherine. Um, and Gabrielle says that that answered it. Um, Amber had to take off and we can wrap up here. Um, we can go a little over. If anybody has any more questions, um, feel free to ask now. Um, I just wanted to mention that we'll be hosting a financial recovery 101 for disaster. Um, that'll be on the 15th of February. I'm dropping a link in the chat to sign up. Um, that'll be hosted by our educator, Winona Doris, and we'll be going through all the different programs um, available for you in recovering from disaster. And that's part of a series that we've been hosting. We already did one on preparedness. Um, we found that all of these, as you can see, there's these are pretty complicated topics, but they're also kind of critical for your um, ability to recover or um, survive when, when disasters happen, um, at which they will and they do. So um, we're hoping to, to offer you these educational series to, to make sure that you're resilient as much as possible um, in, in this realm of farming, which is the financial realm. So um, please sign up for that. Um, we can stay on for about five more minutes if anybody else has any more questions. All right, it sounds like we've wrapped up. I just want to really, I want to thank um, Kitchen Table Advisors for co-hosting as well as Scott and Catherine. Thank you so much for your work today and sharing all of your knowledge and, and being around um, to ask, to answer these um, nuanced questions. Uh, we really appreciate your time. Um, I'm going to be sharing your contacts with everybody if that's okay, so they can be in touch with you and I'll be sharing a recording of this. Um, as well as some resources that were shared today. So we look forward to being in touch with you all. Thank you much so, so much for your time. Again, I'm Katie from Farmer Campus. Please be in touch. This is a series. So um, we're happy to, to help guide you through this uh, kind of complicated education. Um, all right, everybody have a good day. Scott and Catherine, go ahead and say. And say stay goodbye. dry as much as possible. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, all right. thank you. I, I know it was a compli it's a complicated, program and especially when we're talking about taxes and that I think everyone's eyes always gloss over but thank you so much for coming thank you Catherine yeah thank you thank you everyone thanks everybody have a great day